history part of, of all of this. Um, so we begin with the fact that the letter form, the beauty of the letter form, has to be balanced with the business of the letter form. You have to make the font, you have to promote the font, you have to distribute the font in some way, shape, or form. And so I go back to the days when Matthew learned how to do all of this. Um, and so we began in 1965 when he was recruited by Mike Parker um, at the Mercantile Linotype Company, 29 Ryerson Street, Brooklyn, New York. And uh, he arrived one day and Eddie, the elevator operator, said, where are you going? And so he went up to Mike and Mike ushered him into a sumptuous office. As I recall, the tile had been imported from Bensonhurst. <laughs> And he then entered the world of the hot, hot metal um, matrix, if you will. The linotype machine was the dominant typesetting device in the world. Uh, they had sold about 100,000 of them. And they made their money from these little brass pieces called matrices or mats. We processed about 100,000, I'm sorry, a million a day in the order department. And they cost about 31 cents each, more for larger sizes and less for the smaller sizes. And they wore out. In fact, Mergenthal, Linotype, uh, Mergenthal himself wrote to the company once and said, I can make them uh, so they will not wear out. And the company said, we're not interested in them. <laughs> <laughs> and so they needed a lot of these. And as a result, it was a phenomenal business. So when he arrived, I, I noticed that Mike Parker always was at his drawing board. But after Matthew arrived, I never saw Matt uh, saw Mike draw again, uh, unless you count the calligraphic graffiti in the executive men's room. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where they made their money. But Matt did not come there to deal with hot metal typefaces. He came there because the world was changing. And as we entered the world of offset lithography, which was replacing letterpress printing, photographic typesetting was starting to grow. And so Mergenthal had to convert its library over to something that was more in line with photographic typesetting. Now, all typefaces at Linotype began with these relatively large letter drawings. And they, that, that was the heart and soul of how typefaces started. And uh, at the Museum of Printing, we have uh, about half a million of those drawings for the 3,000 or so typefaces that were done in hot metal by the Mercantile Company in Brooklyn. Now, when they converted over the photographic typesetting, they made the entire basement a camera. In the upper right-hand uh, shot there, you can see the springs, that the, the entire room was on springs to protect it from earthquakes. Now, I grew up in Brooklyn. I don't recall any earthquakes. <laughs> Unless you, you count what happened, you know, tremors when the Dodgers left Brooklyn. Uh, but the, the, the whole room required that you had to have these glass images on one end and, and film on the other or glass on the other that had a, a photo emulsion on it. And then you photographed all of this stuff. Now, it was very hard for some of the machines. Later on, they went to film. Um, and they started using things like ruby lift. By the way, there's a word you have not heard recently. <laughs> Uh, they did drawings with ink. Every manufacturer had their own approach. Um, and, and most of them started by taking the Linotype library and marching it and then cutting rubies and stealing the fonts. The only thing they couldn't do was use the same names. Uh, so all this manufacture had to take place. And to do that, every typeface had to be tweaked to some extent. Because as we entered the photographic typesetting age, we started to enter an age where typefaces were done to a grid. And that grid went from 18 units uh, to 54 units. And of course, when PostScript came out, it became 1,000 units. It made life a lot easier for type designers. But before that, you really had the challenge of making a typeface fit within the unit system that you had. The, the real heart and soul of, of Linotype really became the three typographic directors in their history. Uh, Chauncey Griffith on the right who really started them down the track to making beautiful type. Uh, Jackson Bird, and of course, Mike Parker, the man most of us revere as the person who really made type. And also got the job of converting that library not only into glass, into film, but into digital. 
And so he not only had to deal with new typefaces, but also adapting older typefaces over and over again. There was absolutely no end to it. Now, that's the complex that was Mergenthaler in Brooklyn. Uh, that, little, that light blue arrow points to where Matthew's office was. <laughs> so, and again, it, it was an industrial building, so if you had carpet on the floor, you know, you were really lucky at that point. Um, I went there uh, last January. You would never believe the Mergenthaler Linotype Company existed at that location. In fact, the door that was to 29 Ryerson was a piece of plywood that someone painted on in 29. That, that was what was left. On the left-hand side were the buildings that made the linotype machines. They eventually moved out to Plainview, New York. And so Matthew got there in 65, and within seven years, they manufactured the last linotype in America. Oh, it was not his fault. <laughs> <laughs> fact, that was the machine, the electron was the device. Uh, again, you'll see a lot of types of machines here. Uh, so, uh-oh. So th this was the liner film, uh, which was their first photographic typesetting machine. I once won a bet by cooking an egg on the top of it because it had these <laughs> tubes inside. I don't know if you remember tubes. Anybody here ever had a Dumont <laughs> television set? Uh, same thing. Um, and it used these glass grids. They made another version of the machine called the liner film quick because it went a little bit faster. Um, and it was a very strange machine because um, it illuminated all the light all the characters in the grid with one giant light, and then with little wedges, closed out the light to all the characters you didn't want, and only let the light for the one you wanted to go through. Uh, now, the interesting thing was, um, the machine then had such vibration, it would literally cha-cha across the floor. <laughs> so, they, they built this gigantic machine called the Minotron 1010 uh, for the government printing office in Wright-Patterson Air Force Base with CBS Labs. It really was not commercial, so they, they adapted the Purdy and Macintosh machine, became the 505, and then they came out with the 303, the 101, the 202, and eventually they ran out of alliterative numbers <laughs> and stopped making these things. <laughs> this machine was another bus, but this machine, I remember they had the press conference at the top of the World Trade Towers, um, and, and they had someone dressed up as Darwin because this, they said this machine was evolutionary. Well, that's true. Um, it, it died in two years because <laughs> <laughs> they were better machines now. Of course, the most popular machine that they ever made was the, the VIP. Uh, of course, it was also the only machine where there was a, a, a competitive font manufacturer who made as much money on the fonts as, as the Mercadona company did. But this was the last film machine they made. From this, they started to move into the digital era. And that got us to the 202. This was a very popular machine as well. And the fonts came on a floppy disk. Now, the question is today, is what can you fit on a floppy disk? A cup. You can use it as a poster. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, uh, in 1984, you had the Minotronic uh, 300, which was the first laser machine. And this is where the real revolution took place. And this is where PostScript came in. Because Postscript, the Mercantile Company, for the first time in their history, licensed typefaces to another company. It happened to be Apple and, and Adobe. And so as a result, you had their typefaces on uh, laser printers, on high-resolution image setters, and even on the screen. And it, it made Helvetica a household name, although some people said Helvetica. Hmm. <laughs> and of course, most people today say Ariel. <laughs> Of course, we move then beyond the, 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 the printed page to the screen. And, and Matthew was, was right to move in that direction as well. So he balanced what he did for print as well as for the screen. In fact, you may be interested that we have lost half of all the printing in the United States in the last 10 years. And that's because much of what we did in print has moved to the internet, to screens, and to electronic dissemination. I once got a call from an editor of Business Week who wanted to know how many PDFs were on the web. I gave him the standard academic answer. How the hell do I know? <laughs> <laughs> but I have a way of finding things out. I called in a grad student. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do the arithmetic, uh, there, there, there are something like, you know, five trillion PDF pages floating around the internet or on emails or whatever. And of course, at one time, they all would have been in, in printed form. Today, they're in electronic form. 
Which leads me to believe that someday, far into the future, the printers of the world will band together, build a cyborg, and send him back in time to kill the guy who invented the internet. <laughs> of course, then the, the cyborg becomes the governor of California, and you know how that turned <laughs> So we went from delivering pounds of, of typefaces. I remember when Helvetica first came out, everybody in the company was recruited to deliver all the brass matrices to the typographers and printers of New York City, so no one of them would have an advantage over any other one of them. And I remember being on the subway with Max at, at one point in time. And then the fonts became glass, then they went to film, then they became tapes for the big computer systems, then they became discs, and then they became downloads. And the most interesting chart is this one. If we go back to the very beginnings of machine typesetting, in 1886 with the monotype, 1890 with the monotype machine, the Ludlow in 1911. Uh, if you track the size of the library, the typographic libraries that existed, we were never more than a few hundred fonts. And then, all of a sudden, it changes. And if you track it, it changes as Matthew Carter came into the industry. <laughs> <laughs> and today, there are over 200,000 fonts. I think Monotype Imaging says they have 153,000 on their site alone. So you can imagine then the new world that designers have of picking from these 200,000 fonts, most of which, of course, are based on Gary. <laughs> <laughs> so, when all the smoke cleared, the Monotype company is long gone. But you know, there were two legacies from that company. One was the classic type library, and the other was Matthew Carter. Thank you very much.